Good afternoon, good day, whatever time of day we are visiting. It is a delight to be a part of the Metro Teachers Workshop. I've been asked to do a workshop on counseling, fighting invisible tigers, anxiety, stress, and depression. In order to deal with this subject, the living forces of life forces us to deal with stress and strain, sorrow and suffering. Uh, we've studied sorrow, we've studied suffering often, but most of us have little understanding of the stress and the strain of life. The COVID-19 pandemic has forced us to deal with stress and anxiety and depression on a whole different level. So let's understand that the English word for stress is derived from the Latin word, which means to draw tight or to be drawn tight. So the concept of stress really relates to pressure applied either from the outside or from the inside. Uh, a real working definition for stress has to do with the gap between the demands that are placed upon us in everyday life and the strength that we have in meeting those demands. So think about that for a moment. Stress is the gap between the demands that are placed upon us and the strength that we have to meet those demands. Stress involves those pressures and how we perceive, what we believe, how we react, and how we cope with those pressures. While stress is not a biblical word, the concept is biblical. And since this is a workshop for people in the faith community, we want to tie what we do uh, from psychology and also from the scripture. And I can have some appreciation for uh, trying to learn both disciplines. So listen to Paul. He gives us in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 4 through 7, he gives us a concept. He does not use the word stress but he describes it. Listen to what he says. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse number 4, he says, For indeed, when we came to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest. Hear that. Our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. So there were conflicts inside and fears without. So Paul says, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. So the word translated trouble literally means to squeeze or to press. This is where we're getting the idea of stress. So how we react to those pressures, how we react to stress, it's what causes the anxiety, and what causes the depression. So I'm going to spend the bulk of my time, since they've uh, given me the assignment to try to deal with stress and f anxiety or fear, and to deal with pressure that winds up actualizing itself in depression. Any one of those topics would have been too difficult to deal with in the allotted time that I have. So what I've decided to do is to take us back to talk about that gap between the pressures that are put up on us and the strength that we have to deal with them. In, a, in other words, it's that gap between all of your ought-tos and your can't-dos. 
So the gap between what you ought to do and what you feel like you can't do because you don't have the strength to do it is what leads us to the anxiety and the depression. So I've come up with a therapeutic construct that I call de-stress. I'm only going to be able to do the highlights for it because we don't have uh, enough time to, to do an exhaustive study of all of this. Uh, as you are aware, uh, these are issues we don't spend a lot of time with, so all I'm going to be able to do is to kind of expose you to some concepts. If you have additional questions, if you have uh, additional help, you can always call the Marcellus uh, Church as their life management center, and, and I'm working as interim administrator for the Southern Hills Life Management Center, so either place will deal with you one-on-one -on -one if you need additional help. But take your paper, and I want you to write down the word de-stress. Do that acrostically. Now, I'm going to forewarn you. We're going to have to deal with some technical issues in the presentation. You're going to have to listen to this more than once for it to really benefit you. You'll probably listen to it for the first time to be able to decide that you understand. Then once you go back, listen a second time, you take your notes to try to make sure that you can now take what you think you understand and start applying it. So you're probably gonna spend at least three times with this presentation for it to do you the best good. Write the word de-stress. D-E-S-T-R-E-S-S. -E -S -S. If you do that acrostically, I want to take each one of those letters to formulate the therapeutic construct that's going to help you deal with your anxiety, to deal with your depression, or to help you deal with your stress. The D in de-stress is going to stand for discovery examination. So what you're going to have to do is to assess those stress points. What are the stressors? I'm going to kind of show you how that works in a few moments, but that's the D. You got to discover and examine those stress points, the kind of stress that you find yourself under. The E is you need to evaluate those stress events so that you come to some understanding of how stressed out you are. There is low stress, there is medium stress, there is high stress, and there is extremely high stress. Okay. So D is for discovery examination, E is for evaluate stress events, S, believe it or not, is sensible eating and exercise. We're going to have to discover that because we are three-dimensional beings, body, soul, and spirit, they live so close to each other that they catch each other's diseases. So you have to be as concerned about your physical being as you are your spiritual being and your soulish being. Discovery, examination, evaluate stress events, sensible eating and exercise. T is going to be taming the tigers. When you find out what these stressors are, when you find out the things that are pushing you to be stressed, you got to figure out how you're going to tame them. You can't tame them until you identify them. So D, discovery examination. E is evaluate stress events. S is sensible eating and exercise. T is taming the tigers. The R 
is relaxation techniques. How you, you find yourself under distress, so we've got to talk about some breathing techniques, so the kind of things that you can do to relieve immediate stress and pre uh, pressure. E, effective coping skills. Uh, if things are making you angry, if things are, are pushing you to take on more than you know you are able to do, you got to learn how to say no. You got you to gotta be able to have some coping skills. And then, of course, S is going to be sound sleep because while eating is important, while exercise is important, you can't punish the body if you're not getting enough exercise enough sleep. And if we, had more, if we had more time, I could do a whole lecture on sleep because there's a difference between sleeping and resting because a lot of us sleep, but we don't really rest while we sleep. So we, that's because we don't prepare to sleep. And then, of course, the final S is spiritual faithfulness. Now, I've pretty much given you the overview of what you're going to do if you're really going to deal with being a healthier person. So let's go uh, to the beginning again. Discovery examination. The D in distress is discovery examination. You got to identify which of the seven kinds of stress that you may be experiencing. Okay? All stress is not the same. So let's spend a moment, talk about the seven kinds. There is something that is called time stress. Time stress has to do with your scheduling. The pressure that you're on because sometimes maybe you wait till the last minute to do things, you don't account for things to go wrong, you gotta have them done at a certain time, and so you gotta develop some habits to, if, if you are supposed to start a project at four, you can't start at four, you gotta start getting ready and be ready at 3.30 to do what you got to do at 4. So you got to change your habit because some of the stress you are under is called time stress. It has to do with how you manage your time, how you schedule events. You don't make room for things to go wrong. So you are stressed out when something goes wrong. So you've got to calculate it. I can get from my home to where I'm supposed to go for my appointment. And I'll get there five minutes to the time I'm supposed to be there. But what if you run into traffic? What if something goes wrong with the car? What if you have a blowout? you got to anticipate something can go wrong so that you allow enough time so that you're not under the gun. Now, if this is an appointment that's life altering for your job, you can't afford to call in with an excuse for being late. So that means you got to prepare differently to do that. That's called time stress. The second kind of stress is called anticipatory stress. Anticipatory stress. You'll probably know that better as worry. Those are the things that you anticipate going wrong, so you spend all your time trying to say, this is what is going wrong, what can go wrong, will go wrong, you gotta prepare. You, can't, you need to be concerned about those things, but you can't be overly concerned that it turns into worry. That's anticipatory stress. So are you stressed out over something, or a concern that you are overly concerned with. You're more concerned uh, about what you face than figuring out a strategy to get it done. So there's time stress, there's anticipatory stress, there is situational stress. Some situations you are in, sometimes it's most of the situational stress is going to come from either people, problems, or projects. It's how you react to certain people in your life, how you react to the problems that you have to face in your life, or how you react to the projects or the assignments that you are responsible for. 
not reacting to those properly are going to always cause stress levels. So there is time stress, anticipatory stress, situational stress, chemical and nutritional stress. That has to do with what you eat. Sometimes you are taking in too much caffeine, too much sugar. We're not even talking about tobacco and alcohol. But all of those things have bearings on your attitude. That's what I meant a few moments ago when I talked about the body, the soul, and the spirit. They live so close to each other that they catch each other's diseases. They feed off of each other. So some of the stress that you are under could be chemical or nutritional. Stress number five is job stress. Number six is encounter stress. Uh, you, you, the people that you are tied to, the people you're connected to, the people that you have to deal with, the people you encounter day by day. You know, the occasional people you run into that's off the wall, off the chain. You know, those people don't affect us as much because we deal with them from afar. But the people that we are connected to, you got to figure out their mode of operation to learn how to navigate around them because, you know, everybody have a bad day. There are some people that we are connected to have a bad day all day, every day. And so you got to learn how to deal with the encounter stress. And then the seventh stress that some of us have is what I choose to call vicarious stress. That's when you take on the burdens of other people. Parents fall real easy prey to this kind of stress because as parents, we, we, we want to spare our children from pain and suffering. That's a whole nother topic for discussion. But the fact is you cannot want for someone more than they want for themselves. If people are gonna be healthy, it's like the table that I'm, I'm setting before. You know, if I ask you to help me move this table, because it's your table to move and I'm helping you, that means I get on one end of the table and you get on the other, and we carry the table together because it's too heavy for any one of us to do. Now, if I'm helping you carry your table, you don't want me to pick up one end and you walk off and leave me with the table. And that's what happens with vicarious stress. People will come to us and bring us their problems and bring us their challenges. And, I, and if you are not good at making sure that you set boundaries and find some balance, you'll wind up being more invested in their problem than they are. They'll walk off and leave you with the burden and they're going on by their business. So some of the depression, some of the anxiety, some of the stress that we have comes from us not properly identifying the kind of stress that we are under. So there's time stress, anticipatory stress, situational stress, chemical and nutritional stress, job stress, encounter stress, and vicarious stress. So do, do not become so accustomed to feeling stress that it becomes a normal part of your life. When you're dealing with Encounter stress, for instance. It's easy for you to say, that's just how so-and-so is. That's true. That's how they are. But that doesn't mean that's the way they ought to stay to be. They are the way they are because of learned behavior. So if I'm going to help you grow, if we're going to be in a relationship together, then the both of us 
have to grow together. That means you have to own your stuff. You have to be willing to change so that we can live together peaceful, peacefully. So that's the D in distress. I'm spending most of my time there because that's where the problem is. You can't solve the problem until you first identify the problem. The E in distress is evaluate stress events. So, so the next strategic step is to take a stress and eventful uh, assessment. Uh, there are only so many life events that can happen to you that will not, you can deal with one or two, depends on their market. So uh, there is this Holmes life stress inventory that's kind of the standard for understanding stress. And it, it looks something like this. There are points given for every major event in your life. For instance, under the Holmes uh, raw life stress inventory, the death of a spouse is 100 points. A divorce is 73 points. Marital separation from a mate is 65. Detention in jail or other institutions is 63. Death of a close family member is 63. And when you start adding them up, whatever they are, and they go smaller on the inventory. So if you've got two major events going on in your life, you got separation from a job, or you've got the death of a spouse, or you've got a divorce, you're under a lot of stress because when you add it up and they exceed more than 150, that means you are under undue stress. So when you go to a therapist, which is the reason we're having this conversation, you don't go to see a counselor because you have mental illness or you have mental challenges, no. You go to identify problems and try to find solutions. And since we all are body, soul, and spirit, we all have problems, we all have stress that we have to deal with. So one of the things that we can best do for each other as members of the body of Christ is to understand that I can't fix all my issues by myself. So that's why we have shepherds. That's why we have ministers. That's why we have professional counselors. They will help us come to some understanding of evaluating how much stress that we are under. So the discovery examination is D, E is the evaluate the stress events. Now we got to talk about sensible eating and exercise. Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 7 says, go, Eat your bread with joy and drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already approved what you do. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Proverbs 25 and verse 27, he said, it is not good to eat too much honey. You say, you don't need to have too much sugar in your system nor is it honorable to search out matters that are too deep. So the scripture declares that we ought to go easy on sugar. It's not bad to eat honey or sugar in general. He says that there are healthy boundaries. So there is the principle, watch your diet carefully. Eat plenty of healthy foods, fresh vegetables, fresh fruit, vitamins, especially B and C. Reduce the intake of stimulants like caffeine and nicotine, that helps you. Then, now you gotta deal with not just eating patterns, but exercise. Exercise regularly. You gotta come up with some kind of exercise routine, whether that's walking, running, or whatever. First Timothy 4 and verse 8 says, bodily exercise profiteth little. NIV says, and listen to this, this is very interesting. For physical training, 
is of some value. So when the scripture says in King James, bodily exercise profited little, doesn't mean that he, there's not little. He's using contrast. It's little compared to what you're doing with your soul and your spirit. Didn't say it didn't profit anything. It said it profits little in contrast to what you do with your body and soul. So physical training is of some value. There is value there. So don't just cast it aside as a meaningless activity because if you're going to live to be a healthy, older age, you need to be concerned about being physically fit. So you're going to need a healthy mind to do battle with your stress. So body, soul, and spirit is where we find the balance to be healthy. The T is in Tame of the Tigers. If you are experiencing mental stress, you perform mental exercises. If you're experiencing physical stress, you perform mental exercises. as well as mental exercises. In other words, you have to guard your mind because that's the only chance you have for taming your tigers. Whatever those weaknesses, whatever those unhealthy habits, that's what we're calling the tigers. You gotta identify them, you got to be able to come up with some strategy to deal with them. In your lifetime, you may very well have five or six, 10 or 15 issues you need to be working on. You can't resolve all of them at, at one time, identify the priorities, work on them, and over time, you get better with all of them. Taming your tigers. Know your blind spots, know your weaknesses, know your bad habits, identify them, attempt to grow. Then you gotta learn how to relax. Relaxation, that's the R, a little sleep, Proverbs 24, verse 33, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. In fact, when the Lord gave the 10 commandments, Exodus 23, 12, he said six days you ought to do your work, but on the seventh day you ought to cease from labor so that your ox and your donkey may rest and the son of your female slave, as well as your stranger, may refresh themselves. In other words, you gotta have a time to relax and rest. So you gotta take time to relax. So you gotta come up with some kind of relaxation techniques to be able to de-stress from the pressure you are. Breathing exercise, all of those. We don't have time to get into that. Effective coping skills is number six. That's the E. In order to develop better coping skills, you have to reflect on your current stressful situation to see what you need to learn about yourself and your coping skills. In other words, God sends into your life people, problems, and projects to help you grow. Some people come into your life for a reason. Some people come into your life for a season. Some people come into your life for a lifetime. You have to decide how you're going to react to people. You have to decide how you're going to react to your problems, and you're gonna to have to decide how you're gonna to react to the projects that you have, because that's how you grow. If you don't reflect on the people that you have to deal with that are positive and the ones that you have to deal with that are negative, then you're gonna find yourself in a situation where you are under stress. So you gotta come up with a strategy that people problems and projects are the things that force us to grow. If you don't have a strategy for dealing with those, you're just going through what you go through. So you don't wanna just go through what you go through. You gotta learn how to grow through.
And that means, number seven, and we're almost there, sound sleep, the amount of sleep you acquire, you probably need about eight hours of sleep, six to eight. If you're trying to operate on less than six or eight hours of sleep, you're not getting enough rest to refuel, refuel yourself. Overwork, poor sleep habits, and lack of exercise are the enemies of good health. All right, come, 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 come a little closer. Let me whisper that to your soul again. Overwork, poor sleep habits, and lack of exercise are the enemies to good health. It doesn't take a Harvard psychologist to determine why most of us struggle getting a good night's rest. When we are anxious, when we are worrisome, when we're overworked, when we're overstressed, we find it difficult to have a good night's rest. So the less anxiety and the less restless thoughts that you have, the easier it is for you to fall asleep. So that's why you have to be careful what you do before you go to sleep. You don't want to watch the 10 o'clock news before you go to sleep. You don't want to watch horror movies before you go to sleep because you, are, you, you don't have time to mentally adjust from all the trauma and all the drama that you go through to be able to sleep soundly. So I could do a whole lecture on sleep itself. But then finally, we have to deal with spiritual faithfulness, how you live out your faith. See, the, the difference between Christians and non-Christians is really not that we don't have stress, that we don't have problems, that we don't have all of those things that everybody else has. The difference is we use our faith to help us deal with all of them. So this, this whole construct of de-stress has come out of the spiritual principles of trying to live out your faith. So in summary, de-stress is the tool that you're going to need whether you're dealing with this pandemic, whether you're dealing with the everyday life, once we get back to normal, you're still going to have to learn how to de-stress. Discovery, examination, D. E is evaluate your stress events. You got to ascertain how much stress you're under. S, sensible eating and exercise. T, taming your tigers knowing the buttons that send you in the wrong directions to make you angry, make you fearful, make you worrisome. You gotta identify some relaxation techniques, that's the R. The E is effective coping skills. S is sound sleep. And S again is spiritual faithfulness. And when you can't do this by yourself, you seek out help to become a more healthy person. Go with God, and God will go with you. That's my prayer for you. I want for you what God wants for you, and that is to be a difference maker, a family changer, and a community impactor. Be blessed. Go out. Be blessed on purpose. And don't forget to brag on the one who made it happen. Peace.